Video games are an ultimate form of expression, encompassing audio, video, animation, UI design, gameplay systems, mechanics, and much more. Yet, great game design is not solely focused on how the game looks and feels, but on how they keep players motivated to learn and engage with the game. In other words, all video games must be learned to be played. In this way, educators can learn a lot from game designers to create meaningful classroom experiences. In this video, we'll talk through three things connecting game design to classroom design. Why we're talking about video games to begin with, defining the key elements of game design, and designing games as it relates to classroom experience. In the description, you'll find multiple free resources that pair with this presentation to help you plan and think about student learning, including notes to think about your own classroom environment. Before we continue, it's worth noting that we're not talking about gamification or teaching using games. That's a separate discussion. In this case, we're examining how game design helps us fundamentally understand learning design. Games are an extension of human nature. They're a form of play. When we play, we rapidly learn about the world around us, even if it's simulated. By playing games that help us make choices and take actions, we form meaning about the world. Game desires create the context for that meaning. The theories surrounding great game design are the same as the theories of human learning in general. The reason why this matters to teachers could be understood through this idea of semiotic domains. Defined by linguist and video game aficionado James Paul Gee, semiotic domains are a set of practices using multiple modalities to communicate meaning. In other words, a semiotic domain contains words, practices, experiences, and other signs to construct meaning within that space. For example, teachers are likely familiar with project-based learning, multimodal literacy, Maslow, Blooms, and LMS, blended learning, and more. Yet, these terms are probably unknown to people who aren't teachers, or may mean something entirely different in another field. What's interesting about semiotic domains is that by immersing yourself in a new related domain, you not only understand the new domain, but you understand your existing domain more. By learning about video game design, you're problem solving inside the domain of teaching. In this way, we're thinking in systems. We're recognizing that there's linkages between how players will continually play excruciatingly hard, complex, and nuanced games. They'll stay engaged even when they're frustrated, and how that could also work on similar challenging classroom assignments. However, in most cases, students aren't going to engage in their classwork in the same way that they're playing games. We can learn from that. When we learn within the system, we're framing our understanding at three levels. All systems start with rules, the formal. In a game of chess, certain pieces can only move to certain locations. It's incredibly rare for those rules to change, and almost everyone sticks to the same rules of chess. These rules are then related to culture and society. Although the rules are simply just moving pieces around, you cannot understand the rules and see the impact of chess on society, such as the defeat and latter victory of the AI chess powerhouse Deep Blue or the popularity of the show Queen's Gambit. We've adapted sayings altogether from chess, such as saying checkmate or keeping something in check. The final part of the system is that we connect with others based on those formal and cultural levels. When we're playing a game within a cultural context, we experience feelings. We act a certain way and we build relationships with the other people playing the game. At the end of the day though, chess pieces are just pieces with rules. When we add people moving those pieces around, we begin to create meaning and make sense of that meaning. As Tina Sylvester, creator of RimWorld writes, game design isn't in code, art, or sound. It's not in sculpting game pieces or painting game boards. Game design means crafting the rules that make those pieces come alive. Games are learning spaces, and therefore, great educational practice will mirror much of what they do. Games are crafted with mechanics. These are the rules and things you can do within a game. Then, events are what occur when a player interacts with those mechanics. In Breath of the Wild, mechanics consist of moving, jumping, swinging a sword, riding a horse, and the bad guys. And in this event, the player is combining those mechanics together to find a horse, ride it around, decide to swing at these goblins, and then gallop full speed away. In the classroom, mechanics are the rules, the protocols, and the frameworks. It's what students can and can't do, like grading policies, how students engage in conversation or discipline. Events are then how students interact with those mechanics. 
such as being proud of a high grade or being upset at a low one. After creating mechanics that lead to these events, that should lead to emotion. The goal of great game design is to create subtle, small, emotional moments that keep players engaged. Otherwise, they'll become overwhelmed and jarred out of that experience. There are six key ways that games bring about emotion, which are very similar to what we see in classrooms. The first is through learning. Human beings want to learn. We want to have those aha moments that drive our relentless curiosities. It's satisfying to get it, where we piece together small, intricate, non-obvious lessons toward a massive realization. And we develop insight when we take all of this information and give it meaning. The second is through the environment. Human beings are naturally connected to the nature and nostalgia. We want to experience the world around us, relating to where we've grown up in historical eras and art styles that we identify with. When we're removed from those spaces, we become more stressed and anxious. The third is through challenge. Humans are naturally curious and want to overcome the impossible. We like to set goals that we often can't complete. These goals are either set by the game or they're open-ended. For example, many players will set goals in Minecraft, which are incredibly complex and multifaceted, yet even young children will set those goals and accomplish them with hard work and determination. The fourth way we connect through emotion is through socializing. Think about a game of catch. Is it about the game or about the players? Not many people play catch because passing a ball is really that much fun. Instead, it's about connecting with the other person. It's innately more satisfying for most players to cooperate or compete with real people as opposed to a computer. And many of our strongest emotions are through celebrations, heartbreaks, deception, and love, things that are easiest to experience at least with people. The fifth is through acquisition, the rush of earning something. We like to earn things and we like to have things. However, that can be misused and we'll talk about that more later. And finally, the sixth is through spectacle. It's that overwhelming sense of beauty, artistry, music, sound design, storytelling that brings everything together. It's important to note that that only works when it reinforces what was already an amazing experience. Otherwise, all we have is all style, no substance. These emotions connect with our values. When we experience events related to our values, we'll have that emotional response. These are central to the themes of all art, learning, and human experience in general. Exploring the themes of love and hate, safety and danger, friend and enemy, victory and defeat. Notice that we're not talking about the idea of fun. In the same way that games aren't just fun, classrooms aren't simply fun either. They're deep, nuanced, complicated, and emotional. Tying this all together, mechanics lead to events which evoke emotion. All of these events and emotion over time are an experience. Meaningful classroom experiences will feature well-designed mechanics, students moving through those mechanics in different ways through events, experiencing a variety of emotions, and developing authentic learning. Understanding emotion at a deeper level helps us craft these experiences in games and in classrooms. In this chart, we're mapping intensity, very intense and not intense, and valence, negative emotions and positive emotions. As a designer, we want players to move between the central part of this chart to keep the game interesting and fresh. Sometimes we may opt for players to reach the edges, but not often because we don't want to overwhelm them. If we were to stay at the center of this chart, it would be very boring. Neutral games and neutral classrooms are just rote memorization. There's no underlying purpose. They're worksheets and packets and things that you're just doing for the sake of doing it. If we stay in one quadrant, we're going to fall flat. In many ways, we're just operating now a neutral space where nothing ever changes. We've just pivoted where that point is. A game or classroom in a constant state of relaxation is going to be incredibly boring over time. Instead, we want to experience a wide variety of subtle emotions, happiness, relaxation, sadness, and annoyance. We're moving quickly around the chart and different people have different reactions at different times. Likewise, we can experience strong emotions for brief moments for powerful experiences. In video games, most players will experience a swamp a few hours into the game Elden Ring. These are vast areas that must be trodden through strategically to avoid the buildup of rot and poison. They're slow and painful and frustrating, and they certainly evoke a sense of misery. And those swamps are going to appear multiple times throughout the game. As explained by the game creator, Hidetaka Miyazaki, 
I feel like our approach to these games, not just Elden Ring, is to design them to encourage a player to overcome adversity. However, we obviously wouldn't want to keep players in the same place for too long. If you kept players inside these swamps the entire game, people would be frustrated and they'd give up. Yet, many people look at those sections with nostalgia. They think about overcoming those goals and how tense that experience really was. In a classroom setting, anger and grief is likely felt during the most intense yet important lessons, such as covering the Holocaust. Sadly, some curriculums have toned down these stories to make them less vivid and less emotional. Yet the purpose of these lessons is to recognize just how horrible they were. After all, the goal is not to repeat it. Brief, profound moments of extreme emotion call attention to important concepts. We wouldn't spend weeks covering the Holocaust, but certainly after a day or two, those lessons are powerful and we tend to remember those things the most from our courses. The way that we design our mechanics to begin with has a large impact on what emotions might be felt down the road. By creating simple, reusable, and unrestrictive mechanics, our mechanics can interact in complex ways. For example, in the game Super Mario Odyssey, the relatively simple concept of moving, jumping, and tossing your hat on things to gain abilities leads to interactions of flying around the map with seamless aerial acrobatics. Well-crafted classroom protocols and mechanics, such as portfolio check-ins, certification processes, design thinking, conversation norming, all of these can be simple and elegant. However, it can be difficult to think about elegant mechanics in school because so many school policies are just not that simple. Instead, we have to think about getting rid of a lot of things to simplify the learning process. For example, lessening the amount of different tasks that students complete each day. Lessening or removing grades that cause students to feel judgment, feel stress, and overthink learning. Lessening or removing homework to focus on just time at school. An elegant mechanic would just be not having homework. Maybe changing up the lesson every single day with new tech tools and activities is not necessarily the best route to go down. Perhaps just doing a few concepts really well with increasingly complex ideas will lead to more fruitful results. When done well, these mechanics should lead to a flow state. This is where we're totally absorbed into the idea. It's a stream of tiny successes and emotional events where we're totally engrossed. Time flies by and the day is over before we know it. Yet for players and students who find tasks too challenging or too easy relative to their skill level, they'll be anxious or bored. We have to find a happy middle ground for all students at all possible levels. So to summarize, we're creating elegant mechanics in games and in classrooms. These mechanics lead to emergent phenomena. These events that people are creating within those mechanics, they're experiencing emotions as a result, and all of this as a collection are experiences. We're building the systems in which everything else happens. This helps us fundamentally understand learning design rather than tinker around the edges day to day. If our mechanics or our core rules are broken, we can't build effective learning environments. All that said, players and students have a wide range of skill and therefore a wide range of what's considered challenging. Mostly everything interesting has to have some kind of challenge and challenges are created through depth. Something with little depth, like a game like tic-tac-toe, quickly becomes boring because it can be figured out. Once you know how to play, it's impossible to win or lose. You always tie. Games like chess are difficult and challenging. Some players might be intimidated by the complexity of the game, but it still has new strategies being developed after thousands of years, even though it has relatively limited, elegant mechanics. We can make things more challenging and add depth by introducing new mechanics. For example, the game Achi from Ghana is essentially tic-tac-toe. However, after placing all of your pieces, you can slide any piece to an open slot. This leads to a lot more complexity to play in your next move. However, if we have too many mechanics, it will become completely overwhelming for the vast majority of people. For example, the board game Kanban has a dedicated yet extremely small player base. It features this massive board with a ton of rules. So therefore, we want to find a sweet spot of elegant mechanics where we don't want to add too many, but we also don't want to have too little. We want a situation where most can engage at the relative difficulty level. Sometimes we'll introduce mechanics that seem elegant at first, but they lead to a lot of complexity down the road and it's messy. In many games, a player can't swim. 
The reason is that when you introduce swimming to a game, you introduce a lot of complexity. What happens when the player swims out too far? What happens if other things interact with them in the water? What if they go underwater? Can they go underwater? In order to solve this, designers then have to put in other mechanics, usually an invisible wall. That's messy because we're gonna have to keep introducing more and more mechanics to solve what could have been a more elegant solution. Just don't let the player swim. In this way, we can think about using semiotic domains to think about the invisible walls of our classroom. Although a bathroom pass may look elegant on paper, you know, we're just simply telling a student that you can only use a restroom so many times, what other stipulations might occur? What about a student who has to frequently use the restroom? How is learning impacted by having to use the restroom? What about students who have periods? What if you're sick? There's so many stipulations then surrounding the bathroom pass that at the end of the day, it may be much more elegant to simply remove that mechanic altogether. Just let kids go and talk to them if they abuse the situation. Adding mechanics can also increase the difficulty level. And sometimes we want to ensure that there's enough mechanics and interactions between mechanics that players and students can always improve. Otherwise, we'll hit what's called a skill ceiling. Once a player has figured out everything that they need to know, they simply can't get any better. The game then just has one emotion of being neutral or relaxed, and it quickly becomes boring. We want to raise the skill ceiling as high as possible while making the skill floor, the level that you need to understand the play, relatively low. Therefore, the game is easy to learn and difficult to master. To accomplish this, we can consider the concept of elastic challenges. That means that no matter what skill level you're at, there is something that you can engage with to challenge yourself. You may attempt something way above or way below your skill level, but there's always something to do. In the game Minecraft, players at the skill floor can learn how to manipulate the world around them. They can stay in their starting biome and craft, build a house, they can explore. There's no urgent need to progress. As they become more familiar with the mechanics, they can tackle more intensive builds using additional crafting recipes. They can explore more of the game world for rarer stuff and recipes. Advanced players then can take on challenging encounters and they become more skilled in combat. And for those who want more of an ample challenge, they can play against other players with the skill ceiling only being as high as the best possible combatants. This maps into the game's skill range. When players first start playing, they start at a manual level. They're learning what the buttons do and how to use them in combination with each other. They then use these controls situationally. They're figuring out when to use the buttons at certain times in regards to the game. Finally, they're transcending the base understanding of the game itself toward the mental. They're understanding the meta game, reading other players, predicting what may happen, and deciding what's worth and not worth doing. As one engages with their semiotic domain, for example, a fighting game player, they'll automatically be able to take these skills to other fighting games, and to an extent, other video games as well. In the same way, the more you understand these concepts of game design as an educator, the more you'll be able to refine your skill in teaching. These elastic challenges and skill ranges then pair with the classroom. In a typical classroom, the lowest skill challenges are tutorials, guided notes, research, and prompts, with more student-driven learning as the challenge increases, like projects and publishing. Students who struggle with moving up in skill stay at that manual rote level. Therefore, we have to recognize effective training strategies, as well as consider ways to keep students motivated throughout the process. In the film Indie Game the Movie, the designer of Super Meat Boy, Edna McMillan, explains why the game is so effective at teaching players how to play. Training occurs by giving the player a challenge, in this case, crossing a gap. The player has to apply their manual knowledge to cross the gap, or they'll quickly fail and start over. Likewise, the player is then presented with obstacles, where the player has to learn how to use their existing mechanics, such as running up a wall, climbing a wall, or a running jump. This is in contrast to the way many games simply tell a player exactly what to do through text. Sometimes the game will just show all the buttons and say exactly what all of them do. That seems elegant and straightforward at first, just tell the player what to do and they'll do it. Yet, most players aren't learning that manual step through text alone. The learning has to be applied. It's just not an immersive learning experience to stop play and read all of that text and put it into action. In the classroom, we can think about this perhaps through language curriculum, where learners are presented with vocabulary lists and expected to learn a language. 
there's a space for vocabulary lists. But research will highly suggest that people learn better through emergent means, by being taught in the language and using it, and using translation tools at their disposal. This is especially true when we look at how quickly people learn languages when moving to another country. They're pairing what they're learning with action as opposed to reciting rote memorization. To keep players interested in training, while simultaneously increasing their difficulty level, we use what's called the Achievement Principle. This rewards players based on their skill level, with better rewards as they progress upwards and fewer rewards for simply doing that easy task over and over again. Although a player could choose to keep doing the easier task, they are highly suggested to increase their challenge, and when this is done correctly, a player doesn't feel forced or frustrated into making something more challenging, they desire it. What we want to avoid are players then becoming stuck when they're training. If a player gets to a point where they can't progress, they're trapped in what's called a failure trap. In the old Resident Evil games, a player would have to find ink ribbons to save their game. If they didn't find these ink ribbons or they used too many, they simply couldn't save anymore. And although this added a lot of tension because you could just run out of saves, it also meant that players who ran out of ink ribbons were hitting a failure trap. They would have to start the game entirely over to make progress, and most players would just never do that. They quit the game. In newer remakes of the Resident Evil series, the ink ribbon mechanic has been slowly phased out. They're reserved for higher difficulty levels or they've just been eliminated altogether. The failure trap mechanic just wasn't worth the heightened emotional state. In the classroom, failure traps include failing a test and not being able to make up one's work, or missing content that can't easily be caught up, chronic absenteeism, not being able to engage in content because of inaccessibility, resources not designed for learning needs, or even everyone just being forced to move at the same pace. At this point, students will be alienated from their skill level and stuck in a failure trap. And in some cases, that failure trap has already occurred prior to the school year even starting. They may have encountered a failure trap in years previous and never progressed since that point. In games, failure traps are overcome by introducing mechanics based on the achievement principle and difficulty curves. For example, in the game Hades, failure is normalized. The game gets easier and has more options the more often you fail and encourages risk-taking and trial and error. It expects you to fail multiple times, and you earn rewards if you make any progress at all. Failure is an act of iteration that incrementally allows you to progress further and further into the game. In the classroom, this means allowing students to make up work without penalty, allowing for multiple means of assessment, removing barriers to learning like disciplinary tools that push students out, and letting work be redone and refined. Students can direct their own learning and set their own challenges. Likewise, we should also examine how games define difficulty. Many games use explicit difficult. This is where difficulty levels are predefined. It's linear. The game places you on a path. For example, you're just choosing easy mode, intermediate, or hard. Other games use adaptive difficulty. The game gets more or less challenging, depending on how good you're doing. The game we just mentioned, Hades, gets easier the longer you play it if you keep failing. Finally, some games use implicit difficulty. This is where the player is involved in creating the difficulty level. They choose which levels they want to play, the difficulty of their levels, or perhaps they're designing the levels themselves. Usually, the most popular games that are played for extremely long periods of time, like Fortnite, League of Legends, Minecraft, World of Warcraft, Rocket League, these all feature implicit difficulty because players have multiple modes or types to play to choose from. Implicit difficulty is part of creating a more accessible game. In addition to letting the player choose how difficult their experience will be, accessible games recognize the importance of visual, physical, auditory, and cognitive settings. They ensure that all players are able to enjoy the experience. And accessible games allow players to express themselves by letting them approach tasks from multiple ways, perhaps through classes, gear loadouts, or maybe just an entirely different play setup. This pairs with an educator's understanding of a universal design for learning, which requires multiple means of engagement, implicit difficulty, representation and action, accessibility options, and expression. In other words, to create accessible classrooms, we need spaces where players can choose the level of difficulty they want to engage with in course materials, while being motivated to engage in more challenging tasks over time. We need to encourage that all classroom resources are accessible to learners, including through multiple means of access for things like discussion, writing, and group work. And we need students to express themselves in the ways that they want to day to day. Some students might choose to work through audiobooks, another day they might work on a visual novel, maybe another day they read a research article. 
When players have different skills and with them different challenges and they're progressing through this training, they have to keep being motivated. And that's the hard part of teaching as well. How do you keep people motivated and engaged through all of this challenge? One way that this could be done is through extrinsic motivation, offering some kind of external validator for engagement. In video games, extrinsic rewards are typically used best early on when the content is extremely challenging. Through spectacle, players don't mind if they're not doing well because everything just looks and sounds super cool. Over time though, those extrinsic rewards aren't as needed because players can just craft their own awesome experiences. In the classroom, this looks like pairing extrinsic opportunities like field trips or community experts, school events, games, and other hooks that rope students in. Importantly, all of these extrinsic rewards have to be lessened over time because if a game or classroom experience is entirely dependent on extrinsic motivation, they'll lose all of their own motivation over time. The goal is to have players and students eventually become intrinsically motivated. They want to see their own identity reflected in the game or classroom. They want to see themselves making a difference and being immersed. They're solving challenges in their own ways and succeeding simply because they want to. It's enjoyable. They're experiencing small, subtle, emotional events throughout each session that keep them hooked. This involves creating safe spaces where students see themselves in the space, ensuring that their identity is reflected in the content. We have to ask how many of our students are giving up their identity when they enter the classroom. In the same way that a game would alienate players who force them to engage in ways that they don't enjoy, a classroom cannot be a space where students have no connection to what they're learning. Earlier, we mentioned that acquisition is one way to create emotion. To do this well, we create what's called reward alignment. This is how closely our activities align to what a player or student would already be doing. Our mechanics have to consistently reward players for their work without working against them. But let's pause for a second here and address how this could be used for more sinister purpose, extrinsic motivators that don't work, which comes up in both fields. Much of what we understand about extrinsic motivation can be traced back to the behaviorist research of B.F. Skinner, who studied the impact of consistent incremental rewards to curb and train behavior using pigeons. In what was called the Skinner Box, or more formally an operant conditioning chamber, animals will be trained to perform a task, usually by pulling a lever, to receive a food reward. Over time, animals will learn to pull that lever quickly and efficiently. So it perhaps could be said that if you just put a bunch of students into a room, train them through memorization, do the exact same thing over and over again, they'll become more quick and efficient. But the problem with the behaviorist model is that it takes an incredibly complex notion of engagement, motivation, and learning and simplifies it to animals in a lab. Although there are short-term gains with enacting behaviorist principles, such as having every student do the same thing at the same time for candy or for grades and doing it over and over again, it has prolonged negative effects. Because we know that if you keep giving children candy and candy over and over again for a task, they're going to expect that candy in the future. Look no further than a free pizza program from reading books in the library. Although this may serve as a form of emotional acquisition to get students to start reading, after a while of receiving those prizes over and over, most young people are just going to skim and speed read to get as many pizzas as possible. The point is no longer an intrinsic love of learning, but the reward at the end. Many mobile games exemplify the trend of building what would be called a virtual Skinner box. They're focusing entirely on acquisition, where they abuse these dopamine loops to wildly addict players into a reward-based system. Although classrooms like these games could be designed as a very well-rigged Skinner box, it isn't a classroom that we would want to attend. When we build spaces like this, we're dehumanizing people into manipulatable objects that no longer have emotion, goals, purposes, or desires. They become husks to be programmed and sent off into the world. They're unable to critically think about shaping a better society. The last concept we'll explore is progression, or the way that games move the player from one stage to the next. In linear games, the player simply moves from event to event. The game is programmed through stages or cinematics to chart a course forward. In choose-your-own-adventure games, you're moving through an ever-expanding selected experience. Although they can feel very personalized, most players don't get to experience a lot of the game. It takes a lot of programming to account for every single one of these experiences. And finally, there's the hub and spoke model. Players are introduced to a concept, moved into a space where they can choose from many options, they complete a certain amount, and then they continue onward. In most modern games, the hub and spoke model is used to let players express themselves while still being able to easily plan the storyline. Arguably, classrooms best fit the hub and spoke model, where players are introduced to a concept, they're given options on how to learn and express their understanding of that concept, 
then they come back together to share and learn new ideas. There's also other types of learning progression that could be hypothesized, like an open-ended makerspace, and by visualizing progression in these ways, we can effectively design meaningful mechanics for learning. In summary, we're recognizing how well-designed mechanics or systems-based thinking lets us create the structures for events evoking emotion for authentic learning experiences. By making elegant, simple mechanics, we allow for ample opportunities. By creating spaces with accessible difficulty levels that train students well and keep them motivated in extrinsic and intrinsic ways, we create multiple opportunities for creativity and success. In closing, when we look at all of these great examples of games, it makes us rethink many of the practices that we do in school. Think about this. How many great games and situations where challenges where you fail once you can't start over, solutions with only one right answer, walls of text defining key ideas that you may or may not use later, tutorials that are given but never actually used, mechanics that work against each other rather than in tandem, games that increase difficulty to the point where many players quit, a final challenge that if done wrong invalidates the entirety of the game's progress, games that make you feel judged for not knowing what to do, or games that will just assume you'll continue playing, even if you're confused or frustrated. Thank you for listening. If you're interested in learning more about Human Restoration Project, including finding a ton of free resources for educators, podcasts, writings, and more, visit our website, humanrestorationproject.org, and check out these awesome books that inform this video. Again, you can download a bunch of free resources regarding this presentation in the description below.